It is my privilege to introduce our uh, guest speaker today, Dr. Pat Reynolds. Uh, Dr. Reynolds is a medical director for the Centers for Families and Children at University Hospitals in Cleveland. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Reynolds when I was at NAMI Ohio, and he served on our board. Um, we had uh, a lot of fun together. Our board always um, mixed, you know, pleasure with, <laughs> with business. Um, so there was always activities. And one of the things we got to do was to visit his, his hospital. And so I have a, um, you know, good feeling in terms of the work he does. And I can picture him in his office. <laughs> um, uh, one, the, you know, as we all know, uh, an important piece of our work in making uh, AOT effective is um, helping people to engage in their treatment, and primarily that involves uh, medication adherence. And uh, we get questions all the time from many of you is how do you measure medication adherence? Uh, when is the right time to intervene? And what are some uh, tips that both courts and treatment teams can use to help get people uh, to want to take their medication and to really kind of buy into it. Um, so we've asked uh, Dr. Reynolds to talk to us about that today. He was one of uh, three lead experts in a report that was um, issued a couple of years ago by um, the National Councils. Uh, we've attached it to some of the emails uh, announcing Dr. Reynolds' um, visit with us here today. But if you haven't taken a look at it, uh, it's, got, it's just uh, full of excellent information. It's called Medication Matters, Causes and Solutions to Non-Adherence. So we've asked uh, Dr. Reynolds to talk to us uh, for about 30, 35 minutes today, and then to leave plenty of time at the end uh, so that you can ask him some direct questions. But before we get started, um, we've got a couple of polling questions. We thought it would be nice for Dr. Reynolds to kind of get a sense as to who's in the audience. So um, if you have, uh, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, we're going to do these. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Amy kind of to take it from here since she's our polling expert. So, so you say, all right, <laughs> we want to know where you're from. So just type in your state. California. Wow. And as expected, Texas and Ohio. Oh, look at that, Maryland. Well, that's fabulous. Hawaii. All right. So uh, clearly, we have uh, a national audience, and it's good to have you all here. And the next question is, what's your role? This is supposed to uh, have reset itself. and a good balance between clinical and uh, monitor. Oh, good, we do have some court staff here. And then of course, uh, we love to have our AOT champions uh, participate in these. So. And I see in the chat that we have uh, Cassandra from Butler County who's legal counsel. So we've got some legal folks here as well. Oh, um, yeah, excellent. Thank you all for, for doing that. That's helpful to kind of get a sense in terms of who's with us. Um, so at this point, uh, Dr. Reynolds, will turn it over to you to uh, take it from here and then uh, we'll wrap things up at about um, 3.40 and start taking some questions. Perfect, and thanks so much. Uh, pleasure to be speaking to everybody here. Um, I am not gonna pull my chat up. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. 
um, when you have them, we'll go back and circle back and look at those because my goal here is to get through a, a chunk of material and then give us a nice chunk of time to kind of talk and have some discussion. Um, and so I'll share my screen now uh, and uh, just making sure people can see my screen uh, and see the presentation. So let me know when that's up and ready to go. You're good. All right, so just a quick disclosure. Uh, as indicated, I was, uh, I, I was one of the three uh, uh, lead editors. I was actually the lead editor for this particular uh, report that the National Council for Mental Wellbeing put out. This is formally, formerly the National Council on Behavioral Health. Uh, and uh, we did this report about three uh, or four years ago, um, got a lot of uh, really great response. I was one of the principal architects. I am still one of the members of the Medical Directors Institute of the National Council. And so I am speaking to you as a member of the National Council and someone that is uh, obviously very interested in this. And for those who don't know, I'm also, uh, I'm primarily based out of Ohio in the Cleveland area. Uh, Cleveland Rocks. And so for anybody uh, who knows uh, that area, I work at university hospitals and I'm the vice chair of psychiatry there. So just a little bit about me. Um, so what I'm going to do in this uh, presentation, and you're going to see me go through some slides a, a little bit quicker, um, is my goal here is to split this into two sections to first talk about the problems with adherence, what, like what, where do we see the problems, what problems result from non-adherence, uh, and then talk a little bit about kind of solutions. And we'll focus a lot on kind of some of the clinical solutions here. Uh, and uh, hopefully this will be, uh, uh, generate a lot of discussion. And my sense is, as with most audiences, this is not a particularly clinically complicated uh, uh, presentation. There shouldn't be that many words in here that throw you all off. By all means, if you're having trouble with something, uh, Bet Bet Betsy knows a lot of the stuff that you can jump in and kind of answer questions to, to, to verify. But uh, uh, Betsy, I'll, I'll rely on you and Amy to kind of jump in if I need to explain something in more detail. So um, it's really, uh, this stuff is kind of obvious, right? Um, adherence to medication matters. Uh, medications don't work when they're not taken. And um, this was uh, attributed to someone who wasn't themselves involved with mental illness. Um, but adherence is uh, uh, kind of core to everything that we in psychiatry do uh, with regard to, to medications. Um, I'll tell a quick story. Um, I was uh, working at a community mental health center and we got a pharmacy at our community mental health center. And we were very excited about this for a variety of reasons. We thought it'd be great for people. So all of the psychiatrists started sending patients down to the pharmacy. And uh, part of the pharmacy being there was for business purposes. And so they were tracking how many referrals they were getting from us. And about two months into it, um, we had someone come down to us and uh, the head pharmacist and say, you know, um, we, uh, we aren't getting, getting very many referrals from you. And I was floored by this because we were all very excited about it. And I went back and talked to the psychiatrist who all said, well, we're trying to refer everybody. We'll, we'll try harder. And he came back at month three and said, we're actually only getting about 20% of the patients you see coming down to us. And it didn't flare. He, he came to our, our, our medical staff meeting. He didn't square with what he was seeing. And when we kind of got through with that meeting, what we decided is, well, let's watch and see what happens. And we sat down and just watched the, the lobby between the medical staff offices and the pharmacy. And what we watched happen was people would be walked down by the psychiatrist, go into the pharmacy, the psychiatrist would leave, and 30 seconds later, most of the patients would just walk right back out of the pharmacy and right out the door, meaning they were not staying. We thought we were dropping them off, and then they just weren't coming in and picking up the medications. And when we looked at that and realized what was happening, what that told us and what we learned in that moment was that about 60% of the medications we were prescribing to the world based on this were not actually doing what they were supposed to. And that came back and led us to say, wait a minute, maybe 60% of the visits that we have and that the government of Ohio is paying for are not actually achieving the value they're supposed to be achieving. That's heavy and that's huge. And that's uh, kind of drives on this point about adherence matters because if we don't pay attention to it, you know, we're doing a lot of work and spinning our wheels. And uh, that, that's, that means really patients aren't getting the treatment they need. So uh, just to kind of start highlighting the, pro uh, the, the problem. So there's, it's hard to actually measure adherence as it turns out. Um, and the reason it's hard to measure adherence, and I'm just gonna leave, uh, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on, on this slide. Uh, the reason it's hard to measure adherence is because short of me sticking a scope down your throat to see if the medication went down there, 
almost everything is an imperfect measure uh, method of measuring. And so we can certainly do a direct observation method. We can certainly look and say, okay, I've watched you put a pill in your mouth, uh, but boy, that's a whole lot of, that's a whole lot of time. That's not very practical. And there's all these other methods we can look at. All of them are frankly just tough to, you know, all of them come with uh, 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 problems, right? All of them come with short shortcomings. So the reality is, is when you're looking at thinking about how to, in the real world, test for adherence, uh, there, you probably want to pick up two or three different methods and mechanisms for looking at what, you know, whether or not people are taking the medication. The most uh, kind of thinking about what, how, how we measure adherence, before you even get to measuring adherence, you have to have an idea of what adherence is. And so looking at the bottom of this slide, the first thing, you know, we say to people is adherence is taking about 80% of your medications. That sounds a little weird um, to say it's not 100%, it's about 80%, uh, 80% or more, but it's worth noting that most medications are pretty effective if you're taking them about 80% of the time. That includes psychiatric medications. And um, in, in the regard of thinking about whether or not you're taking your medications, the main way pharmacy and pharmacists look at adherence is this thing called the medication possession ratio, the NPR. And basically what they're looking at is, is, you know, how, if someone's supposed to be taking a medication, let's say they're supposed to be taking 30 pills a month, how many of those pills are actually landing in their hands so that they might take them? And in that regard, what they're really looking at is fill rate. And the easiest access data, the easiest way to look at data on this is to understand how, uh, how much people are picking up the actual medications. And pharmacies track this all the time. Um, providers usually don't. So most providers, unless they have a pharmacy in house, I'm not looking and calling the, the pharmacy and saying, did so-and-so pick up a medication? But the easiest way to kind of get some sense of a very gross way of thinking uh, whether or not someone might be taking their medications, we know they're not taking them if they don't pick them up. And so the NPR is very useful for knowing that they at least got into the person's hand. Now, Obviously, once they get in the hand, they have to get into the person's body, and that's a whole different set of things. But at the most basic level, one of the biggest problems we see uh, from any individual with uh, behavioral health issues is that they don't pick the meds up to start with. And so it's worth noting we're going to talk a little bit. You're going to see the uh, NPR come up in a couple of the slides here. So also really important to talk about is rates of non-adherence to medications vary across uh, um, uh, 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 conditions. Uh, it is not just the province of mental illness and substance use disorders that people aren't adhering to medication. So certainly coronary artery disease has uh, as high or nearly as high of non-adherence rates as, uh, as most other things. And if you look at this, it's actually roughly equivalent to schizophrenia as non-adherence. And so this is, coronary heart disease is really things related to, um, related to uh, uh, atherosclerosis. And this is your medications like Lipitor uh, and, and, and other medications that lower cholesterol. Um, some medications people do well, diabetes isn't rocking it out of the park. Asthma, there's a lot of trouble. And in asthma's case, how you take the medications is important. And so the, that very, that window's huge because a lot of people try to use the inhaler, but use it wrong. Um, and there are other places where people do well. People with HIV tend to actually be pretty good at taking their medications. But it's worth noting that across almost all behavioral health issues, not just schizophrenia, but a whole lot of them, people struggle to, to, to uh, take their medication. They struggle to adhere. So uh, within the behavioral health, we know that there's a lot of problems. And obviously, this is something that is a concern. Um, and just to kind of, sorry, I'm, I need to move something really quick here. Um, go away. I'm, uh, there we go. Um, sorry, I've got some things blocking. Uh, this is just another slide saying uh, pretty similar stuff. Don't want to spend much time on this. When you break it down and look at things like schizophrenia, um, you've got uh, uh, schizophrenia. When you look at um, a self-report, um, people with schizophrenia say they have uh, non-adherence at about a 20% rate, which means if you ask them what schizophrenia are taking their medication, about 80% of the time, they say, yes, I'm taking my medication. When you then go and look at things like NPR and uh, direct observation and some other things, it actually falls down quite, quite a bit lower. And uh, it's worth noting that it's actually probably closer to about 50% of people with schizophrenia, and that's including your long-acting injectables, are adherent to the medication as prescribed. Um, and in the Katie trial, uh, it, which is the, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that was the major trial we did to look at the side effects of antipsychotics and their impact on folks, as well as the efficacy of the different types of antipsychotics. Um, 
And in that regard, we know from that study, which was about uh, 1,500 patients around the world, uh, that 40% of patients discontinue their antipsychotic medications on their own. Amy, you were going to jump in there? No. Nope. Uh, okay. Um, then uh, 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 going down bipolar, uh, schizophrenia has been really well studied. Uh, bipolar, another severe mental illness, has been less well studied, but the data we have shows pretty strong adherence uh, mirroring with schizophrenia. And when you throw in substance use disorders on top of either of these, but particularly bipolar, adherence goes way down. So when you get those uh, folks that have uh, the substance use disorder on top of the uh, mental health, health issue, it really increases rates of non-adherence. Nothing surprising there, I don't think. Um, the consequences are a problem, obviously. People don't take their meds. Uh, about 10% of hospital admissions in mental health uh, are uh, uh, attributable simply to non-adherence. 22% nursing home admissions for mental health. Um, whoops. Uh, uh, $100 billion a year in unnecessary hospital costs. All of this stuff, and this is all just in mental health. This is, uh, this is stuff that uh, for people with mental illness. So this stuff is a big deal, right? Now, I want to be very clear that this is for people with mental illness, but not necessarily hospital admissions for mental health issues. So people, it's important to recognize people with schizophrenia are, are also non-adherent to things like cholesterol medications and diabetes medications and those kinds of things. And so all of these things uh, wrap into those numbers, but those things matter just as much, right? So is, uh, is, is that why that's so low? Because I would have expected 10% uh, of hospitalizations more than 10% to be. So remember, uh, the thing I'd say there is when you try, this is not just schizophrenia, this is every mental health issue out there. So when you actually throw all those in, there's a lot of people, there's, you know, suicidality, things like that are not, you know, a lot of those things aren't related to that, right? Um, so uh, antipsychotics more specifically, this is where you uh, look at those rates going up. So in the world of hospitalizations, um, only about 13.5% of admitted people who are admitted with uh, schizophrenia uh, are, are adherent. And when you get up that, that's that adherence, about one third of uh, people uh, who are non-adherent uh, 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 non end up um, getting, getting admitted to, to hospitals. So that's the, that's the number you were thinking. It's probably a little bit closer reflecting to your, to your reality. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, this gets you to, this is a little bit of a slide to think about partial adherence. So what you're looking at here is zero days from non-adherence. So this is the, you know, and then increasing ranges of days uh, since when you took your last medication. And what it shows is that the longer you go, the more likely you are to experience sy symptoms, which again is not a surprise to anybody here, but it's important to see that, which is to say, as you get farther along, of course, you are more likely uh, to get rehospitalized. Not, not a surprise to anybody. Um, and obviously, hospitalization or, 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 you know, rehospitalization is not the only consequence we have. Uh, this stuff you guys will all be familiar with. It is not unusual that someone with schizophrenia or someone with any mental health illness sits down and says, I'm taking my meds, doc, but I'm still feeling really bad. And so we prescribe them more meds or we increase doses more than we really should have. And that increases rates of side effects uh, and all kinds of other problems uh, that aren't great, right? Um, lack of progress towards goals. If you're not taking your medications and you're hoping to accomplish things and, you, and your symptoms are still getting your way, this is a problem. Even if you're not hospitalized, you've got ER usage as a major problem uh, for people who, and, uh, and of course, uh, medications on the mental health side prevent relapse on the uh, uh, substance use side and vice versa. Um, and so all of these things matter. Uh, Non-adherence is not just a problem of rehospitalization, it's a problem of all these things. Um, now, this is a surprise. This is one of the slides I think was the best and most important uh, slides we put out in this because people don't know this. When it comes to schizophrenia, and when we talk about antipsychotics, we're usually that's, you know, we're talking about schizophrenia. Um, a lot of people think the majority of non adherence comes because people don't want to. They're, they're basically, uh, they don't trust the regimen. And uh, in this case, it's worth noting these are the reasons in rank order of why people don't take medications. And I think it's worth noting that stigma is one of them. And that's probably the most common single one. And stigma is where you are wrapping in things like, I don't believe this medication is good for me and delusions and non, you know, and all that. But also in there, almost as high is adverse drug reactions, which by the way, is a totally logical reason not to take medications. If I gain 30 pounds and I take a medication, 
I'm not taking it as a logical response to that terrible outcome, right? Um, and that's a reason to not want to take medications and, you know, keep taking medications. If I had a bad experience once, that's going to scar me for the rest of life. That's not because I don't want to get better. That's not because I have a lack of insight. That's actually a very logical response to not, uh, to what happens when you have a bad reaction. Uh, homelessness and other types of things that are keeping me from just being able to organize my life. Uh, people, you know, if you probably know this, but in case you don't, people with schizophrenia, uh, in particular, have pretty significant cognitive impairments. They're minor in the setting of when you're having a conversation, uh, but people with schizophrenia score lower in cognitive tests, particularly around cognitive executive tasks, and memory problems go along with that. And as people get older with schizophrenia, they develop dementias um, at a higher, at a much higher rate than uh, uh, the general population. Just not having support. Almost all of us on this call. When we have to take a medication, someone is probably there supporting us taking the medication. And that is just not the case with people with schizophrenia a lot of the time, right? Um, certainly, uh, fear of the medication wraps in with the stigma a little, but and denial of illness is there. But look at how low those things are compared with all these other things. And let's be very clear, most of these things are quite modifiable right? So when we think about why people aren't taking antipsychotics, yes, some people don't take antipsychotics because they don't think they have illness or they don't, you know, or, or they, there's some kind of a paranoia that's part of their illness. Um, most of the reason people with schizophrenia don't take antipsychotics is actually quite a lot more logical and reasonable. And it's worth thinking about that as we think about solutions. Where are we? Okay. Um, thinking about uh, adherence uh, frequency, this is just to tell you when you have multiple times a day, I have shifted almost entirely to prescribing once a day medications. This is actually trick number one. If you want people to take medications, make them take it less times a day. Uh, I don't have this in here. There's a slide for some reason it's missing, uh, but we do know that long acting injectables actually have even higher rates of adherence than, uh, than this. So uh, for medications that are twice a day medications, you're just, you just knocked down about 10 percentage points off adherence that just happened, right? And so I'm really clear about that being a major thing I look at when I look at prescribing medications. Um, this is just to drill into that side effect standpoint. People, the, the, the more likely you are to f just be obese, uh, uh, the, as your obesity goes up, the more likely you are to say no thank you to an, uh, an antipsychotic. Just something to be aware of. Um, and again, that's completely logical. Um, so when we start to think about where adherence comes from and how we start to nurture a uh, 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 adherence being better, a, a lot of this comes down to having the right relationship with your provider team. Um, we talk, you'll see here the clinician-patient relationship. I will expand that for purposes of this audience to say it's whoever on the team is someone that the patient has an enduring relationship with. So in my clinic, there's a nurse, there's case managers, social workers, there's the psychiatrist, so on and so forth. We all have varying uh, degrees of intensity of relationship and quality relationship. And anytime you get past the initial kind of just pleasantries, anybody who's got some kind of connection is gonna be a person uh, that can really engage around adherence. Um, and adherence starts with trust, and it starts, and I'm gonna use this word because I use it in so many talks, love. If you do not care, if the person doesn't believe you care about them, if that love isn't there, then they'll know it and they will feel it and that trust won't develop either. And uh, for those of you who are, when I use the word love, I use uh, the definition uh, agape, which is this kind of communal, uh, spiritual uh, 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 regard for others. Um, but these two things matter. Um, and I will tell you uh, another quick story. I had a patient who came in who had schizophrenia and they had pretty significant delusions. And they came into me first visit and said, I don't want to take medications, but uh, so I don't want to see you. And I said, I can understand why you don't want to take medications. There's a lot of good reasons not to take medications, but it's okay. We can keep seeing each other. Would that be okay if we just meet once a month and just check, check in, see how you're doing? And, the, I'll, and I may bring up every now and then whether or not you want medications, but you don't have to take them and that's fine by me. And he said, okay. And he showed up to meetings and every meeting we'd talk and I'd say, how you doing today? At the And we'd talk a little and we'd talk about, sometimes we talk about his delusional content. Sometimes we talk about his life and his mother uh, and things going on in his life because he was living with his mom. Uh, and at the very end, I'd say, hey, any change in what you're thinking about taking a medication? And he said, nope, don't want to take them. Uh, 13 months in, 13th visit I had with the guy. Sit down, have the whole conversation. At the end of the visit, I say, hey, you interested in taking medication? He said, yes. Just that, that was it. He just said, yep, I'll do it. Okay, give me a try. And all of that just is really key to saying, now we were doing that in a very slow way. We were doing that in this kind of what's meet once a month way, but it was 
are really about allowing the person to be who they were and allowing them to trust and see that I cared about their well-being that allowed them then to say, maybe Dr. Runnels isn't so wrong about this. Second piece, and we're going to spend some slides on this if we want, and I'm mindful of the time, but promoting participation decision-making, shared decision-making matters. I want to be very clear, even if you are working in a court on an AOT program, the only thing you have to force someone to take a medication is to send them to an ER. That is the, that is, that is the thing. What AOT is really just a threat that we're going to take you into the ER, we're going to take you to jail or whatever the program set up to do. Uh, but it doesn't actually make the medication go into them. You can tie someone down and essentially make them take a, a acute uh, antipsychotic by, by injection. But we really have a lot less control over forcing medications in people's mouths or forcing them to take long actable than is the reality, right? If you really sit down and think this is, we have very little power, they have a lot of power. Now we can exert our will, but the amount of work it takes to exert our will is very hard. Um, and it's really important in that frame to just kind of say, all right, so this concept of shared decision-making, I have to get some kind of buy-in. Now that my buy-in may be, you've been to the hospital three times, we're gonna keep sending you to the ER, why don't you, you know, there may be some of that, but you gotta still have this concept of helping them participate. Um, when they participate, even if their first decision is no, uh, their likelihood of eventually starting to adhere more is improved. And I will say that, I, you know, one of the things I did with a lot of patients I had was, hey, I'd like to be an antipsychotic. And they'd say, I don't want to be an antipsychotic. And I said, I respect your decision and I'm willing to go with that even, but I will tell you, uh, I'd like to revisit the conversation if you get admitted again in the next two weeks. And sure enough, they get admitted again in the next two weeks and they come back and I said, hey, how, what do you think about that decision? Do you remember a conversation? And most of the time they said, yeah. And most of the time, if I did that two or three times, they'd come back and they'd be willing to kind of ch check in with me and say, yeah, I'll give it a try. Let's see how it goes. Um, and then this concept of hope and positive expectancy. And, and what that really means is um, I believing that the person has the possibility of having an improved life and promoting that as part of the way we talk about things. Uh, and that expectancy that the thing we're giving them is something that might help them. And the reverse of that is true. If it's not helping you, then I don't want you to take it. So I'm giving you a med because I think this med will make a major important thing to you in your life better. And you have to know what those things are. But as you go through, um, not BSing about that, basically. Don't do that. You have to make sure that you're clear that what you think is going to happen can happen. And recognize and be okay with when it doesn't happen, recognizing that reality too. Um, so adherence has, uh, you know, when you get into this, adherence has uh, essentially three uh, uh, kind of phases in clinical engagement. Uh, what we call initiation, what we call implementation, and what we call discontinuation um, are where we talk about medications. And adherence matters in all three of those areas. And you have to be thinking in all three of those areas about how to maximize adherence. Uh, and that's where the shared decision making comes in. I, almost with everybody with schizophrenia I've ever seen, the very first thing I say when we start talking about medications is, my interest is that you take the, a, a medication that works for you. I have almost no skin of the game as to which one that is. Um, and my interest is that you're the one making that decision to try this as much as is humanly possible. Um, and sometimes they recognize there's some coercion going on, but I'm still helping them think through their own lens of what that's like. Um, that's, you know, uh, and, and then um, the implementation part and the discontinuation part um, uh, is all about where we're talking. These are all things that you can make an actively engage with someone around in the adherence process. So when you're having a talk with someone about what's going on, it's not just taking the first dose of medication, it's actually taking the medication as prescribed, and it's actually talking with them and engaging them, hey, you didn't take the medication, or you stopped taking the medication, let's talk about it. These are all areas uh, to focus on. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know we're short on time and I want to make sure we get to some other things. Uh, but I have to tell you that most clinicians, not just psychiatrists, but most clinicians aren't really talking with the patient in the terms that make sense for them. So I cannot emphasize enough, and there's a lot of studies to show this, that the language between the medical folks and the clinical folks is often just very different from the language uh, uh, b b between a psychiatrist and what they're seeing and what they're getting out of this is very different in terms of value. And I really want you guys to look at this and recognize that when, uh, you know, psychiatrists are, and I'll use us as an example, rethinking, I want to stop the hallucinations. The patient is rarely thinking, 
They are sometimes, but the really thing I want to stop the hallucinations, they might be thinking, I'd like to hold a job. They might be thinking I'd like uh, housing. They might be thinking I want to have regular income, but they're rarely thinking, I want to take an antipsychotic and stop the hallucinations. That's not mostly what they're thinking. And so when you start to think about this, it's always important to reframe your goals and understand how the patient might be feeling about the same goals and whether or not they even share those goals. Um, I love this quote. It's more important to the manner of the patient that has the disease than the no matter the disease the patient has. This goes back to trust, seeing people as the people they are and not the diagnosis they are. I have to train very hard to stop people from calling uh, people schizophrenia schizophrenics. Um, that's something we try to go away from because that's not who they are. That's just a thing they have. And the patient and the person is the one that matters the most. So um, shared decision-making, you guys may be familiar with this. Uh, it's the idea of taking this idea of compliance away from, you know, as the thing you're focusing on. Uh, I'm giving you an order and you have to follow it. And you have either complied or not complied with my orders. And moving it toward a, we're in this together. My interest is that we're making a decision together. And sometimes in an AOT program, I'm either part of a program or I myself am, am going to end up calling something that we don't totally agree with. But at minimum, we're going to try to create a dialogue so that you, I'm going to find ways to give you a voice, even when there's some coercion involved. And most of the time when you're the psychiatrist, you're not actually the one that's uh, making a lot of, a, a lot of doing the coercion separately. A lot of times I say is, hey, look, I'm not, you know, the one that's going to throw the, the pink slip. You're going to not take your medication and some police is going to come pick you up. And so that's a thing we have to think about together as to whether or not taking the medication is worth it to avoid that negative consequence. And thinking about that together and setting it up like that so they're partnering with you, even when at the end you've got to make a, some, a better decision, will always lead to a better chance of having that person uh, uh, adhere to the medication. Um always thinking about making sure that the goal of medication isn't to stop symptoms. The goal of medication is to create recovery. Um, uh, and so this idea that we should just be maintaining people on medications just to maintain their own medications is never enough. Um, and uh, I think that's just a really important point I want to make. Uh, and every time there's decisional conflict, the goal is to optimize uh, kind of uh, uh, the overall arching goal of recovery, not simply reducing symptoms. And the patients will respond to that, or the individuals. Um, there's three phases when you're having these discussions. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. You can read these. These make sense. But you never start with a, I'm giving you an antipsychotic. Do you want it or not? You always start with, let's talk about what the choices are that are in front of you. Um, then when they start to say, well, this one and this one said, okay, well, let's talk about those. Let's think about the pros and cons. I'm always honest. I'm blatantly and brutally honest about the cons of taking medications. And it never, every now and then someone hears a side effect I say, uh, and decides not to take the medication, but I got to tell you, they were going to, they, they were not going to want to take that medication anyway. Most of the time that allows them to hear and understand that you understand those things are going to come up and it creates trust in future relationships when you can come back to them. Um, and then whether it's, whether or not they can choose to not take a medication is different than which medication they choose or how they take that medication. Those are finding ways to insert choice, even when the end result has to be, they take a medication, um, Every time you can kind of add preferences to the patient in there, you're going to have a better chance of that person being willing to go along with it. That finding ways to create agency, even when agency is not going to be there. Um, peer supports are a great way uh, to talk. If you're not using them, people with lived experience, uh, there is a lot of data to show that people with lived experience peers are actually better at getting people to take medications than uh, psychiatrists and other clinicians. So it's worth knowing. Um, and here's just a lot of studies to show that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, uh, da, da, da. This is all about peers. I'm skipping over that to make sure we have time to talk because I just have a few minutes here. Um, but um, we, and we talked, I don't know how that, so I got uh, 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 added. So it's really important not to create unrealistically high expectations um, because it will, if you disappoint people, they're not going to trust you. Um, when you're using all this st stuff, things that you have to be clear about, uh, the 70% of people get 70% better. You may not get better. This may not have a good effect on you. Most people have some side effects. That's a real thing. Medication isn't going to fix everything. 
even, you know, it, it, you know, it probably is going to have some positive effects, but it's not going to fix all the problems. Um, it's not going to make all your symptoms go away, probably. Um, and we can't just keep adding meds to make symptoms go away because that doesn't, too many meds isn't a good thing either. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I don't think this is general, uh, this is uh, something we need for this particular audience. Um, but we can go back to this idea. Something I just want to say is um, it's better to get uh, antipsychotic in someone. There's very few contraindications. Um, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but just recognize that we can also promote adherence by not getting kind of cold feet for reasons that aren't evidence-based. Um, sorry, I've got to move some things. Um, I think some of this we've talked about. Um, this is, again, some of the issues with how you run appointments. And I I'm happy with these slides being shared so that people can kind of review some of these. Um, when you're trying to get a truth, hey, are you taking your medication? What are people going to say? Yes. Which is different than how many doses of medication have you missed? That's maybe one of the most important questions. It normalizes missing medications. I take anti, uh, anti, uh, uh, antibiotics. I take medications for uh, other types of things. I miss doses. How many, you know, how many doses have you missed? That's a thing. Normalizing that will help people feel less shy about saying they didn't take it. Um, and all of these questions are designed around helping people think about the fact that they miss medications right? And why they miss medications. And they set up opportunities to talk about ways to avoid that. These are not things that are geared towards people that are needing to be coerced in taking medications, uh, but they're nonetheless things that really matter for a lot of folks. Um, there are all kinds of ways. I'll let you guys meet this. I'm not going to spend too much on this. There are all kinds of ways uh, to, so remember, if denial or uh, of illness or uh, not wanting to take meds because of symptoms is not the main thing for most people, most people aren't taking meds because of other barriers. It's not necessarily the so against medications. And so uh, there are all kinds of ways and tricks that have an evidence base. Um, that can help people uh, be more here in medication. Pillboxes work. Pharmacists have a ton of experience with this and they've actually published a lot of data. Pillboxes work. They just do, especially if you're taking a lot of medications. In fact, the more medications you take, the better a pillbox is for helping you adhere to all of them. Uh, and this is where using a nurse to sit down once a week and go through the pillbox, it's, that works for a lot of people. It's, 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 it's really useful. Alarms uh, matter. Placing the medications in the right place in the place they're residing matter. Those things can all really help. Um, acknowledging people have choice, even if they're being coerced, they still can choose. Uh, coercion is not force, right? It's not direct force. Um, but also stressing that people have uh, uh, owed to themselves to think things through and think both the pros and cons out. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I've gone over some of these things. Um, also assume all patients will experiment with stopping medications, particularly with schizophrenia. I've never met someone with schizophrenia who got a medication, started on that medication, and then at no point in the future said, oh, I'm going to try now. I'm going to see what happens in this when, I, when I stop this medication. That never happens. And so the degree to which people are going to stop medication, um, giving them some tips so that they don't have terrible signs will just help them better. Again, they'll trust you more, even if it means they uh, end up uh, relapsing or ending up in the hospital again. Uh, this is a uh, trust, right? And so making sure people understand that if you're missing doses or you're, you're saying you're stopped, this is how you do it. That matters. Um, it's worth, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but when people aren't taking medications, being clear about why they're not taking medications is not always about the medications itself and kind of being able to transition into some of that stuff. Um, and this gets into that idea of, uh, what can't, you know, medications are going to fix this. For some people, medications aren't the only answer. And this is how you can help people think about how medications compare with other things, uh, so that they don't stop the medication because these things aren't getting better. So reminding them, no, it's not improving everything. Other things need to help with that, but it's minimally necessary to get to some of those other goals. Um, I think this is my last slide and I'll stop here. I went a little bit over, uh, but uh, basically this is just a giant uh, gra grid that kind of gives you a kind of in one picture, all the things you can think about in terms of 
uh, improving adherence. And with that, I'll stop. I'm going to say one other thing which isn't in here, which is, uh, I don't know why not, there's a slide that's missing. Long-acting injectable medications clearly improve adherence and clearly reduce rehospitalization over oral antipsychotics particularly for people that have non-adherence issues. Um, I always give people the option to do, I always say, if you wanna try oral, go ahead and try oral. I always give them that choice first because that's a place where I can let people make a choice, right? Um, but for people who are struggling with rehospitalizations, I push the long-acting injectables early on. I don't wait for them to fail for two years. I go to LAIs as quick as I can. And I, uh, because we have a lot of data to show that rehospitalization rates go way down. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, take questions. And there are a few questions, I think. So I'll stop sharing. So the first question is, is it more effective to take an outcomes-based approach in measuring adherence? For example, less ER visits. Um, yeah, so um, there's two ways I look at that question. If someone's doing well and they're going to the uh, ER less, uh, that to me is like, well, you know, it's <laughs> part of me is like, well, it doesn't matter if they're adherent, right? So, um, but that said, the problem with that approach, which is not a bad signal, <laughs> but is not the right full measure. The problem with that approach is that people will go through period, symptoms naturally come and go. Bipolar is a good example of this. I can be not, I can be adherent to bipolar medication and then not be manic and then not take meds. And my next manic episode may be three or four months away, but I won't have prevented that that way. The best way to think about adherence is to always ask about adherence uh, and to ask about it, not as uh, a yes or no question that, uh, railroads people into saying yes, but to ask about it, look at, you know, the best you can get data from the pharmacy about fill rate and then ask them how many doses they've missed and have honest conversations with them. It's by dealing with it that you're more likely to uncover it. Um, but reduced symptoms can be a strong signal that someone's taken their meds, that no doubt about it. This is interesting as a side note, by the way, I can't see the audience. I assume the audience can see me. And I think yes. uh, just interesting experience. So uh, uh, for those of you who are uh, raising your hands and stuff, I, I've got no, uh, no entree into that. Hold on, I have someone who raised their hand. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. okay. Hi, um, so my son, because of so many side effects, doesn't have a choice in medications. So how do we let him know that this is the best medication for him and that's all he can take, even though it has put 40 pounds on him? Hmm. Um, I want to just say this and I'll say this again. One of the hardest decisions I have to make as a psychiatrist for people with schizophrenia um, is, uh, you know, I can take away your symptoms and stop you from being in a hospital and giving you diabetes. And that's like, that sucks. Um, there's just no two ways about it. And I say that because, um, that you need to be honest that 40 pounds is not a great thing, right? Um, you are right to not like that, you know? And so, and what has to come with that is, there are pros that come with this and that you sh we should all be clear about what this balance is. Um, uh, so whoever his clinician is, and obviously as a parent, you can do this too, but they should be sitting down saying, yeah, this does stink that you gained 40 pounds. I wish you didn't get 40 pounds. I wish I had a medication that didn't make you gain 40 pounds. And that's not an awesome secondary thing, but let's, let's review why we're taking this and let's understand what those pros and cons are. Um, so that they can see a list. This is something we do with people when they're trying to quit uh, uh, substance use, uh, but you know, uh, substances as well, but we're using it differently here. We're using it to help someone remind someone about why they've made this decision. Um, and sometimes that one of the pros is it doesn't give me tardive gastinesia. It doesn't give me EPS. It doesn't make me fall asleep all the time and so on and so forth. And you can go down those. And also the pros are, I have been able to go to work and I have been able to make money and I have been able to, you know, whether it's moving out of the house or whatever that looks like, putting those two things together really matters, right? Uh, and so I, I would say, and then reminding someone that they ha you have agency, this is a shared decision. We're always gonna come here and say, don't not take medications because this is why it happens. But you're part of this process and we want your input. That's, that's how I'd put it. I don't know if that, Francis, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, doctor. You're welcome. 
Uh, I see Janet Hayes has a question here about co-occurring SUD and outpatient treatment along with severe mental illness. Um, so look, that's, you know, uh, uh, if you have an active substance use, so uh, the way I kind of approach, I'm there's a, there's a lot that came into my mind, so I'm trying to kind of filter that down. Um, the right answer starts quite simply, which is someone's got multiple issues and there's an issue with adherence. When, you're, when you've gotten to the point where the person, I'm presuming you've gotten to the point where the person says, yeah, I'll try a medication, but their SUD is getting in the way of the follow through there, right? Um, substance use when you have a relapse is really tough to get around. For a lot of people with SMI, substance use is this chronic kind of off and on. Um, I use, you know, I'll, I, the, 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 a lot of the population I served, crack was a major thing. I use crack once or twice a week, not all the time. And so it was this kind of weird kind of uh, 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 filtering in and out. Um, the, the, that's a complicating factor. And so working with the idea that, ah, we know this behavior is in there. So what are things we can do to kind of set up um, uh, kind of contingencies for when that happens? So number one is a LAI a possibility. So that removes the kind of substance use from interfering with things. Uh, and when I get into LAIs, I am very quick when adherence is a major issue, I'll go to like in Vega Trinza, that three monther. If I can get the three month because that's a thing and the person's willing to take that. And when I get the person and they're not in the moment intoxicated and we have that conversation, that's something I talk about, like, right? Um, so all of this is about when you're having discussions, what are the things you can put in place that are palatable to the person? Oftentimes they'll be a little nervous about accepting a long acting injectable. Um, and you can empathize with that, but kind of, as you kind of get into that, other things you can do, um, if they're at a group home, other opportunities to kind of put reminders, if their drug use is later in the day, can you shift things earlier in the day? There's a lot there, but mapping that all out with the patient and, but almost as importantly with the support staff that are helping them out, those are all things that I've done and I've had some success with that. Let me know if you've got other follow-up questions to that. Um, quick guy. Go ahead. Do the meds really put the weight on the person or do the meds change their level of activity and then thus cause weight gain? We've had actually good studies to do that. It flat out reduces your metabolism, right? So um, sometimes people get sedated and they're do moving a little less, but no, these medications flat out reduce your metabolism. And we've watched this. We've actually had people measure overall um, activity in a day uh, along with the meds and the weight gain is clearly more. These, it's tough, right? I actually, I work as hard as I can to avoid typical second generation antipsychotics. So risperidone, Seroquel, Geodon, Zyprexa, I avoid those as first choices almost always. Uh, medications like Abilify um, and then older medications like Profenazine, I try those in every possible way to find some combination of those that will work when possible. Then I go to the atypicals. That's my practice. Not every psychiatrist does that, but that's how I do it. Um, and uh, so for those who have uh, other questions, uh, feel free, uh, Amy and Betsy, to, to have people give my email. I'm happy to answer questions by, you know, or, or set up a time to talk. Um, medical marijuana, very quickly. Uh, there is no evidence of any kind that marijuana has any positive impact on uh, any mental health issue. End of story. There's just none. It's, it's, it's actually starkly clear that marijuana does not help with anything. Uh, marijuana is a comp so, but I will tell you, and this is true, not for schizophrenia, this is true for every 25 year old kid with anxiety I've ever met. Everybody loves their marijuana and they can't imagine life without the marijuana. And it is a long discussion for people who they're not using other drugs. Marijuana is a pretty big part of their life. They're convinced to the core of their being that the marijuana is something that's allowing them to function, despite the fact that they're still scoring 10 out of 10 on anxiety and all this other stuff. But just so you've heard it, it doesn't help anything, no matter how much the person believes it helps. And in fact, the data shows that people will say the marijuana is really important to me. And then when they do symptom measures, it's a, it, they still report really high levels of symptoms. Uh, so if that's not clear, uh, marijuana in some states is getting approved for PTSD. It does not help with PTSD. It doesn't. Don't know why it's getting approved. Ohio approved it for PTSD. No clue, but it's there. Uh, but there is no value to marijuana for mental health. There's a lot of other drugs for testing. Don't need to get into this uh, ecstasy for PTSD that there's some promising evidence on. Marijuana is not one of them. Um, is there any way to mitigate very high prolactin levels with megatrinza plus low dose clozapine? Um, 
the treatment for prolactinemia is to change the doses around. Uh, we do not have a great medication that stops it. There's some effort to do that. Um, that would fall into the category of I don't have a great option. I usually uh, look for something else. Um, but I got to tell you, closet, if you're on closet pain, you, you hit the end of the line already. So, um, you you probably don't have, a, you're probably backed in a corner with that. Um, and that's a good regimen, right? But, uh, yeah, I don't have any great answers for that. It's, it's a tough problem. Um, one we haven't found a great solution for. All right. A any other questions? Go ahead and, uh. Uh, I will, I, I will look, uh, uh, yeah, you know, um, so to Debbie who asked for that, there's data sources. I would say, yes, the data is nice. The harder question is how do you have this conversation? Right. Um, and I'll see if I can dig around cause that actually might be more useful. Cause you know, I, I will tell you, uh, it's good to say marijuana doesn't help with anything. Um, it's probably more important. How do you guide that conversation? Uh, and I'll see if I got a good, I'll see if I got it, particularly with schizophrenia, I'll see if I got a good one. Um, oh, and Janet, you're saying that there might be a, a PSA, um, but, uh, uh, oh, no, you're talking about that thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, uh, you know, one thing I see in schizophrenia is there's a age-related uh, kind of acceptance of symptoms. And people in their 20s, uh, it is a, it's a hard, it, I've, I've had a little success myself. As people approach the late 20s and early 30s or what I would call five years of disease, uh, they start to be able to listen a little of the marijuana conversation. Um, I do think one thing I'll say right out, by the way, is start the conversation earlier, make it a shared decision-making conversation. So don't say marijuana is bad for you, you got to stop it. Say, what are you getting out of What's helping? Can we keep having a conversation about this and framing it? Always frame it in their words, always kind of report. Now you can add information. Did you know it doesn't help? but mostly they're attached to the marijuana. The data is not the thing. I like the marijuana, right? That's the thing they want to keep doing. And in that regard, kind of helping them kind of hear and understand things that might be causing problems with regard to the marijuana is really helpful. And the most common one is when you smoke marijuana, you get rehospitalized a lot, don't you? Um, you know, is that, or do you see that as being a thing? And there's a denial piece of that, but kind of connecting it to real world consequences they don't like is, is probably a useful way to go. And then continuing to let them talk in their own words. Those conversations can be frustrating. I told you that story about a patient who, um, uh, met with me for a year and then finally decided in month 13 that they take the medication. Marijuana conversations have been like that for me a little too. Nope, marijuana is great. Don't want to stop. No interest in this conversation. And then all of a sudden, eight months in, after I check with them once a month, well, maybe marijuana is not perfect, you know? So, or three years in, but even three years in is often a better trajectory than what's often going to happen. I will say that we have evidence that people who smoke marijuana are a that is correlated with an earlier onset and more severe onset of schizophrenia. We don't yet know, but we have a suspicion that marijuana does in fact lead to a worsening set of baseline symptoms for schizophrenia, but we don't have data on that that clearly states that that's a belief. So one thing that I say to people with schizophrenia all the time is, Snoop Dogg smokes marijuana and he gets away with it. That guy, it is true that people can smoke marijuana, it's okay. That's absolutely true. Um, you have a disorder that makes me nervous about you getting away with it. Not everyone can. I can't get away with uh, any number of activities. And I usually, you know, I, you know, some people can get away with eating Twinkies every day. I'm not one of those people. I gain a lot of weight. Um, and so Twinkies are bad for some people and they're less bad for other people. And marijuana for you with your disorder is putting you at increased risk. It's putting you at increased risk for hospitalization, increased risk for severity of uh, uh, symptoms, increased risk for um, the symptoms being more disabling. And so... That's what we know. Now, you can still make a decision, but I want you to hear and understand that you're someone, despite all these other people that are getting away with it, that should be just a little more careful with it because it's tougher It's tougher for you. So that is what I'm saying. Do people who use uh, marijuana, say for example, anxiety, do they uh, still respond to uh, anti-anxiety medications or because it's not as immediate as the marijuana is. 
So marijuana and benzos fall into this category for me. What I say is they are treatment resisting, uh, they, they help induce treatment resistance to taking other medications. When I take something that makes me feel different immediately, I get used to coping with almost every problem that way. And this is true of alcohol and marijuana and benzos and really a lot of stuff, right? Um, and it makes me more resistant to medications or treatments like therapy that take weeks to kick in. My, my brain gets very used to immediate answers as being a coping technique. There's a major problem with substance use disorders, right? People with substance use disorders struggle with uh, uh, what I would call distress talents. Uh, and people who use marijuana and benzos and all these for managing their emotional uh, uh, acuity uh, run into the same problem. So the issue is mostly that you can smoke marijuana and get something out of, say, an SSRI, but those people typically don't want to do that because they've, their brains have gotten trained that an immediate feeling is the thing that helps me feel better. And that's how I cope, even when my anxiety doesn't actually get any better. So that's, that's how I answer that question. Thank you. Well, it is three o'clock and I think uh, another uh, a number of family members want to move to Cleveland and have their <laughs> kids uh, see you instead. So um, really, really thank you for uh, sh sharing your time with us today. It was such a great uh, presentation and um, I can't say enough how glad I am you uh, spent time on shared decision making because I think that's so important. So. Yeah, you know, this was a, th th thanks so much. This was fun. Uh, this was a, what I call a whirlwind tour. Any of these uh, slides could have actually led to a full another talk and uh, happy to come back anytime.